If you have your Bible this morning, <clears throat> turn to Genesis chapter 3, verse 1. And I've been preaching on uh, maturity, being a mature Christian. It's Mark's maturity, um, examples of maturity in the Bible. And this kind of goes along with that. The, the title of this message is, Seven Things to Help You Keep the Devil Off Your Back. This, uh, probably no surprise to, uh, uh, when I'm going through these things, but a lot of times we don't, we, we read it, but we don't take it to heart. So, Lord willing, you get something out of this, kind of help you to uh, just be wary of what's going on around you. Let's have a word, or let's read the passage first. It says, Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? Let's have a word of prayer. Father, bless the message now. I pray that uh, you'd give us a knowledge of our enemy and the devil. And Father, help us to uh, stay out of his clutches and not fall for his tricks and to understand his wiles. And just pray, Father, that you give us that, you give us that wisdom from the Scriptures. Help us lay it to heart and put it to practice. And just thank you, Lord, for the book. Uh, without it, we have no defense against him. But with it, Lord, we can withstand any attack. And just pray that you would just bless now the message. Speak through me, God. Uh, help me not to tangle up my words. And pray the Holy Spirit, Lord, just lead and guide me through the message. And we'll thank you for that. And thank you for those here. Thank you for our visitors. Just pray that they get a, continue to get a blessing from uh, this ministry. We want to be a help to whoever we can. And we want to see people saved and just pray that you bless our ministries. But bless now this morning, we ask it for Jesus' sake. Amen. You know, the, one of the most confusing passages in the Bible to me is Genesis 3.1. You know, yea, hath God said. Positive thinker, you know, yes, hath God said, you know. Yes, hath God said. But try to put a positive spin on everything. The devil's... Uh, not only he is he the most, between the devil and the Antichrist, he's the most spoken about person in the Bible outside the Lord Jesus Christ. I mean, you talk about a major study, you can do a real study on the, on the devil. And he has his ways about him, and the Bible tells you about it. And these are just seven things that, that might help you. And, or... Seven things, but there's common sense things too, and some things in here that you should already know and already be uh, doing. But you know, he, he knew who to attack, when to attack, where to attack, how to attack. You know, chose the weaker vessel. Um, I'm talking about spiritually. Uh, he, chose the, he chose the secondary creation, the woman. He knew that uh, she might have an issue. Uh, I can tell you this, that it is in a woman's nature. She can get jealous of anything. She can get jealous of a car. She can get je jealous of a fishing pole. She can get jealous of a, 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 you know, a crossbow or a, a recurve. Or she can get jealous of your work. She can get jealous of anything. And I think the devil kind of knew that. She might even get jealous of your relationship with God. So you got to watch him. And you got to understand, listen, you got to understand how you are before you can understand how he's going to get at you. You ought to know your own weaknesses. Because I can assure you he knows your weaknesses. But you ought to know your own. It's like you're not seeing it coming. She didn't see it coming. All right, first thing, turn to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4, look at verse 27. Now, I'm not bad-mouthing Eve now. You know, if anybody else had been in the garden, we'd probably done the same thing. That's what I figure. It's just how the devil knows how to attack. Ephesians 4, 27, and I guess I need to turn there. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 27 says, Neither give place to the devil. I mean, don't give the devil an invitation. Don't give the devil a spot. You see, Eve gave the place, 
gave him a place, gave him an opportunity, gave him an inroad, opened the door for him. You say, why? What is she doing there with that tree? I mean, she's talking, she's talking to him. He's in the tree. What is she doing there? She gave place to the devil. Whether she knew it or not, whether she thought so or not, she saw the thing. She's curious. And the next thing you know, there she is. Having this conversation. And I don't think Adam was there. You know, I know some people think, well, he's right there next. No, I don't believe that. Adam is very, Adam is used to seeing these sons of God and these, uh, and even if he appeared as an angel of light, he's used to seeing these angels. He's used to seeing the sons of God. Uh, he's, he, I think he's clear on the commandments of God. He knows something's happened to her after it happened. I don't think he would have went ahead and just partook of it also, knowing the consequences of it. I don't think he would have done it in the first place if he'd been standing there. The point is, don't give the devil an invitation. Don't give place to the devil. Don't give him an opportunity, because he'll take it every time. Got to know your own weaknesses. Second thing is, is keep your eye peeled for an attack. First Peter chapter five verse eight. <clears throat> First Peter chapter five verse eight. First Peter five eight says, "Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour." I mean, he, he, is, he is waiting for an opportunity, and you're to expect one, or to expect an attack. I think sometimes, um, I've had a few situations where, I mean, I'm not still going to say the hair on the back of my neck stood up, and maybe one time it did, but I knew. I knew. I knew that it was coming. And I, there's been times when I didn't know it was coming, but there's times I knew it was coming, I could see it coming. It's like, whoa, get out of here. Do this, do that. I knew exactly what to do from the Scriptures. But you've got to keep your eye peeled for an attack. You've got to be aware that the, the, uh, the devil wants to find a way into your life. He wants to find a way to destroy you. Look, there's, only, there's one thing He can take from you. He can't take salvation from you, can He? He can't take eternal life from you. He can take your testimony. He can take your, your will to serve God, uh, your will to tell people about Jesus Christ. He can take that from you. Now, from that, He can take a lot of other things from you. I mean, He can take your health. He can take your life. He can take your rewards. Because eventually, He'll get the okay to take you out. If you keep living like that. But what I'm trying to get at is he's looking for opportunity and he's looking for an invitation. Uh, don't give him an invitation. And be aware that he's out there seeking whom he may devour. He's just, yeah, I know we think, you know, oh, the devil's never going to mess with me. Yeah, he will. Yeah, he will. You're in a Bible-believing church. You're, you're already in a minority. You already have a target on your back. Why? You've got the power. You've got the book that Jesus quoted back to him. You've got the scriptures. You don't have a butter knife in your hand. You have a sword. He's going to want to disarm you first. You could do him the most damage. So don't think he's going to leave you alone. He's not going to leave you alone. He's going to mess with you. And your family, your friends, everything around you. I've seen it over and over again. I've seen things, you know, I've got a, I've got a message called smooth sailing, and, and, but then. <laughs> I mean, smooth sailing, but then you've got your rockladon. You've got this storm that comes. And that, that's just the way it works. One day, listen, everything's going fine. It's sun shining and glory to God. And the next day, man, the bottom falls out of everything. There's a major catastrophe or there's a, a, a major uprising in the church. You know, who knows what's going to happen? I've learned to expect it 
You know, I never know the intensity of it or what, where it's going to come from, but I expect it. Especially if a bunch of people end up getting saved. Especially if the church starts growing again. I expect problems. Because I know how he is. And I know if we're not sober and vigilant, we're not even going to see the attack coming. You're going to get blindsided by, blindsided by it. And that's the other thing, is to know how the devil operates. In 2 Corinthians chapter 2, look at verse 10 to 11. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 10 and 11. Now, if you're not doing anything for the Lord, I mean, if you've been saved for 20 years, you're not doing anything for God, the devil's not going to mess with you. You're perfect. He'll leave you where you are. If you want to see if, you want to see if what I'm telling you is true, just do something for the Lord. Just, just avail yourself and say, you know, Lord, I'm going I'm to do something for you. See what happens. Tell him you're going to do something. See if you, if you don't get pushed back. I mean, if you're not doing anything, why, why would he mess with you? I mean, you're, you're exactly where he wants you. But boy, you start doing something for him, and you'll have relentless attacks. 2 Corinthians 2, verse 10 11 says, To whom ye forgive anything, I forgive also. For if I forgave anything, to whom I forgave it, for your sakes forgave I it, uh, or forgave I it in the person of Christ. Lest Satan should get an advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. That's what I want to know about. He says devices, plural. I want to know what he's going to use on me. One of them here is unforgiveness. He's talking to the Corinthians about a, a, a man that sinned a great sin. As a matter of fact, he's kind of proud about it. He said, look, you know, we can't have that going on in the church. You get together with, with my spirit, we'll pray, we'll, we'll turn him over to the devil for the destruction of the flesh. This fellow got wind of that and got right. I'd get right. Turn me over to the devil for the destruction of the flesh? I figured the devil would probably take his time on you. He got wind of that. He gets right with God. And then they talk about forgiving the man, restoring him. I mean, you know, we either, we either go too far one way and allow sin in the church, or we go too far the other way and, and, and beat somebody to where they're, we never forgive them. You know, that's, that's the tendency to just go, oh, you went this way too far, now you're going this way too far. Paul said, look, if the guy got right, restore him. He said, if you forgive it, I forgive it. Why wouldn't I? I know this, that Satan attacked David when he was alone. That's one of his devices. He'll get you when you're alone. He'll really work on you when you're alone. Listen, what you'll do alone is what you can't... I mean, it's the, it's the true test. Because when you're alone, that's when the devil, he's got all the time in the world to work on you. Working with that head. That's when he'll get you alone. He got David alone, and he knew, he knew David's weaknesses. I mean, it's like it was orchestrated, wasn't it? He knew it was. He said, David, would you go out there on that balcony? I want to show you something. Something you'll like. Something I know deep down you want. You know, the funny thing is that the Lord told David, he said, if you'd wanted such and such, I would have gave it to you. I'd have gave, you wanted more wives? I'd have gave you, I mean, he had a few. I mean, look how many Solomon had. But he had to take somebody else's wife. Now, I think David's restored after a lot, a lot of judgment in his life. Now, if you want to go back and read what he went through, it wasn't worth it. Not at all. Lost four yep. Four sheep for a sheep. He took somebody else's sheep, so the Lord took four of his. Uh, there's a, you know, I was talking to somebody just before the, the main service here. We were talking about standing in state. Your standing's good. You're forgiven. You've got eternal life. You've got a home in heaven. You've got a new body, mansion. Your state, you could be a wretch. Absolutely wretched. In fact, Paul said, oh, wretched man that I am. You probably are wretched. <laughs> and I'm wretched. 
My state can vary and be like this. But I'm told to expect these attacks. Uh, faith, is, faith is the answer. And uh, believing God, that's the only way, thing that's going to get you through them. But David was alone. Exactly how's the devil getting to you? You probably know. Sometimes you can just see it coming. You just, you, you just get a little inkling of something that's brewing. And you think to yourself, oh, that's a weakness. Lord, help me. Now, there's some things you can do. The Bible talks about not, uh, make not provision to, for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. I mean, if you're an alcoholic, uh, I, I wouldn't keep alcohol in your home. I mean, I used to be a former smoker, and I mean, I was addicted as any man could be to that former thing. I don't keep cigarettes at the house. I don't even be around people that smoke cigarettes because <laughs> I don't want to be around it. You see, you hate that thing? No, I love it. That's why I don't want to be around it. Because if I was around it, I, I might. If somebody kept blowing smoke in my face, I might. And it only take one to be hooked again, probably. If I hated it, I wouldn't have to worry about it. I loved it. My flesh loved it. There's pleasure in sin for a season. Then the lung cancer. Then the cirrhosis of the liver. You know? I don't want to be around them things because I know I don't make provision for them because I know me. And I figure you're the same way. Don't make provision for it. Don't give him the opportunity. He will take it. And don't even think about fighting back without your armor. <laughs> I don't know. If you don't believe the King James Bible is the Word of God... I don't have much hope for you. <laughs> I'd, like to tell you I'd like to tell you some good things, but I can't. Because the entire armor from head to foot has to deal with that book. You know? I mean, the helmet of salvation, that's guarding the brain. That's guarding your head. Because he'll mess with your head. You know, people that have the helmet of salvation believe they're eternally secure in Christ. Because if you don't believe you're eternally secure in Christ... The devil will mess with your head. I've talked to too many of them know that. Thought they lost it or they, 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 or they thought they lost it and wound up in, in uh, crazy town. Wound up in some ward having to have, uh, be mentally evaluated. I'd lose my mind too if I thought I lost my salvation. Thank God I got on the helmet, amen? <laughs> you know, the breastplate covers the heart. Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. A stab through the heart puts you down. You know, that girdle, that truth, I mean, you've got arteries down there, man. Uh, uh, I saw this one knife one time made during the Civil War, and the way it was held was you, you, you grab it to where the blade is down here facing outward. And a true knife fighter will fight like that. Why? Because he gets in low and he cuts, he cuts right through here. He'll cut your, is that the femoral arteries? Cut your femoral arteries, you'll bleed out in less than a minute. That girdle protects that. Protects your posterity too. Protects your posterity. Knowing the truth protects your posterity because you can give them the truth. And those, um, Feet being shot with the preparation of the gospel of peace. The fact that there's nothing covering the shin guards, you're on your knees praying. You've got to pray your way through this fight. You can't do it standing up. You've got to do it kneeling. But that's sword of the Spirit, man. I mean, if you want to keep the devil at least at arm's length, you've got to have your sword. You know that most Christians on this planet do not have one? A good majority of them don't even have anything close to a sword. They're fighting, with, they're fighting the devil with a butter knife or a spoon or something. But they're not fighting them with the sword of the Spirit. Ephesians 6.13 says, Wherefore take unto you the whole arm of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. 
Ephesians 6, 17, the last part of that says, And the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. It's the only offensive weapon that you have is the sword. And if you want to keep him off you, you're going to need that sword. You can have all the armor of the world, but that does not, that's not going to stop an attack or, or to, uh, to be able to uh, resist an attack. The sword of the Spirit will do that. Jesus Christ, when tempted by the devil in Matthew chapter 4, uh, quoted the Word of God to him. Out of, in fact, I believe every single passage was out of Deuteronomy, if I'm not mistaken. Thus saith the Scriptures, it is written, it is written. That's how you fight it. Now I've got down here, if you get the big head against him, you'll get clobbered. You'll get clobbered. I've... Uh, I saw one time a preacher, and I don't know why he did it. I can't remember who it was or even where it was so long ago. But he went into a tantrum uh, on the pulpit and swinging, at, taking chairs and throwing them across the room like he's throwing them at the devil. <laughs> Let's not wreck the place. I mean, the Bible talks about as one that beateth the air. That's not how you fight the devil. Throwing chairs and acting like you're going to throw a coffee cup at him or a hymnal. That's not how you fight him. You fight him by believing that book and by using that book. That's how you fight him. You know, there was an instance where, um, and, 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 and I think this is really, really true. Sometimes we think, and I think at the charismatic movement, um, I've seen a little bit of that. And in fact, before I ever got into a Bible-believing church, they thought that somehow they could take him on. I'm here to tell you that the day the devil puts his eye on you is going to be a low day in your life. And you will be, you will be fortunate if you survive it. He is just not, he's just not somebody out there, you know, that you can just play with and mock and you think that somehow you're going to get by without wounds and scars. He'll work you over. In Jude 9... It says this, Yet Michael the archangel, whom contending with the devil, disputed about the body of Moses, durst not bring against him a railing accusation, but said, The Lord rebuke thee. Now, this is one of those passages of Scripture you've got to really think about. First of all, what's Michael the archangel doing with the body of Moses? <laughs> That's the first thing that comes to mind. And then, what is the devil's contention with Michael about the body? Now, you know Moses is up, right? He showed up at the Mount of Transfiguration in Matthew 15. Moses on one side and Elijah on the other. Michael was digging him up, evidently. And the devil came along and said, Hey, uh, I got a real problem with that. Uh, you know, I, I got him. He's mine. I mean, corruption. You know how that goes? And Michael said, Look, uh, just doing what I'm told, you know, and the Lord told me to come down here and get him. I'm just going to dig him up, take him with me. And if you've got an issue with it, you know, you need to bring it up with the Lord. He says, well, I don't think so. I said, I'm telling you, the Lord rebuked thee. I'm taking him. Do you notice he showed him, he showed him a certain amount of respect. Put it this way, a certain amount of care. And I think sometimes we get, we get it in our mind that the devil's a pushover. He's no pushover. He'll take you out. As a matter of fact, your only, your only hope is in the Scriptures. If Jesus Christ had to use the Bible to fight off the devil, then where are we? We've got to use the same thing. There's a, another reference over there in Zechariah chapter 3, verse 2. And this one's kind of even stranger. This is the second person in the Godhead rebuking the devil by the first person in the Godhead. In Zechariah 3, 2, And the Lord said unto Satan, The Lord rebuke thee. O Satan, even the Lord that hath chosen Jerusalem rebuke thee. Is not this a brand plucked out of the fire? That's a strange thing because one person of the Godhead is rebuking the devil by the other person in the Godhead.
Now, I think the Lord Jesus Christ now has earned his stripes. The Bible says he's, he's suffered. He's the captain of our salvation. He can do anything he wants to the devil now. But there may have been a time where, look, he had to rebuke him by the Father. I know that sounds kind of strange, but that's what it says. The Lord rebuked even, <laughs> and he mentioned the Lord that hath chosen Jerusalem rebuke thee. I guess what I'm trying to say is if, if the devil is of that kind of foe, then where do we stand? You have got an adversary that is beyond your comprehension. We are like stubble to him. We're like nothing to him. And that's why we need to give care to what this book says about staying out of his clutches. Laodicea is a time of the falling away of the church. It's prophesied that it would happen, and it's happening. And we are just about nearly leavened through. There are three professing branches, that three measures of meal that's leavened, three professing branches of Christendom um, that profess, I didn't say they possess. The last one is us. If you want to call it Protestantism, I don't care what you want to call it, but last is us, and it's nearly done. There are just a few holdouts here and there, a few Bible-believing churches here and there, and you can see they're not full. He's good at what he does, and he'll keep you in church while he does it. In fact, he'll get you all about church and nothing about the Lord. He's very good. We're a holdout. We're one of the last little groups, and I'm telling you, we're in the crosshairs. I see him get him out one at a time, two at a time, a couple families at a time. He works on them. You don't see him flying through the back door, do you? Oh, maybe if we had a bigger choir, or if we just had a choir. <laughs> I mean, maybe if we had. Piano player, I don't think that's going to help anyway, but it'll help, it'll help me. Amen? But even if we provided all the bells and whistles and the bouncy room in the, in the parking lot for the kids, we've still got the crosshairs. That you just might as well just make up your mind you're going to keep doing what you're doing. And that is reading your Bible, coming to church, and trying to win souls to Christ. <clears throat> The Lord Jesus told Peter, no uncertain terms. This is, well, the scariest verse. If he had said that to me, I'd have fell over. Luke twenty two thirty one, 31. And the Lord said, Simon, Simon. Right there would have been bad news, man, when he says, Behold, Satan hath desired to have you, that he may sift you as wheat. <laughs> I said, what does that mean? <laughs> what does that mean? I know what a sift is. <laughs> He's working you out. I hope God never lets the devil sift you as wheat. By the time he got done with Peter, Peter denies the Lord three times. You're dealing with an adversary, you just don't know how powerful he is. In fact, the last point is the best you ever do is stand and withstand an attack. I'm not even going to tell you you're going to gain ground because you probably won't. You will just withstand. I think you'll gain some... Uh, some understanding of how the devil deals. I think you'll gain uh, some strength as a Christian uh, in the fact that if the attack comes again, you'll be ready. But he says over there in Ephesians 6.11, uh, put on the whole arm of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. And then in verse 13, he says, wherefore take unto you the whole arm of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. I don't think you're going to advance too much. You're just going to withstand an attack. You're no match for the devil. So don't think you are. Any encounters with him, if you survive them, they're going to leave scars. Just remember, he's fought better men than you, better women than you, and won. 
There's a, a Dr. Ruckman used to do the uh, uh, do a study on the kingdom of uh, heaven, the kingdom of God. He showed the line of the kings, and I believe there were 26 in a line of succession. And every one of them, the devil knocked out of the ring. Starting with Adam, and he just goes on down the line. And then there's Noah. And then there's Abraham. I don't care who you pick, that Bible will show you the sins of the saints. Show you where they got knocked out. Show you where they faltered. Some of them got up, some of them didn't. We're no different than they are, and we're fighting the same foe. He hasn't changed. He hasn't turned over a new leaf. He's still after us. And He wants you. And He'll do anything to stop you. And you need to be aware that it's coming. You need to be aware that you're under attack when you are under attack. You need to be aware that this is a real being. Okay, he's real. He's not, you know, some the force be with you type thing. He's a real being. And he's walking about seeking who he can devour. You're going to have to fight. You're going to have to fight or surrender. That's the only two options you got. Most Christians just surrender. So I didn't sign up for this. Listen, if you want to get in the ministry, you come talk to me. <laughs> I'll tell you some things. What you're going to encounter. What you're going to be up against. You're going to serve the Lord? You're going to, you're going to do something for Him? You're going to go to the jail? You're going to go to the rest home? You're going to go out on the street? You're going to talk to your neighbor? You better expect trouble. Do you know that every time something good happened in that book, something bad happened right afterwards? You'd be going through the Gospels, you know, and he'll have a victory one day and then a catastrophic event the next. You say, what's going on? It's like the devil waiting around the corner with the ball bat. <laughs> you walk around the corner, wham! He slams you. You'll, get, you'll have a spiritual victory and then, then, then have a major upset in your life. He's not going to let you just coast by serving God without stop trying to stop you. And the best way I can tell you that is just get involved and find out. I don't want you to be scared of Him. I want you to fear the Lord. I just want you to be aware that when the attack happens and your world falls apart, that you're not going, What happened? So, well, that's what happens when you're in war. That's what happens when you get in this fight. Doesn't the Bible say, don't think it's strange? Uh, uh, as though some strange thing happened. This is not a strange thing. You learn to trust the Lord, trust that book. And you know what? The Lord will get you through every temptation. He made it through, didn't He? He'll get you through. But you've got to trust Him with it. You can't panic. You know, most people die when they panic. Whatever goes on, they panic, then they die. Because they always do the wrong thing when they panic. Sometimes they don't do anything. Best thing is don't panic. The Lord is mightier than the devil. He can play with him like, a, like you play with a bird. Okay? Understand you have a greater power, but it's in this book, not in you. And if you'll do that, you'll do well. Just realize where the power is. Realize where, realize where the armor is where the sword is, you'll be fine. But just realize it's coming. I don't know what we've got facing us in the next few years. I thought it'd be a lot worse than this, to be honest with you. I'm not so sure it's not coming anyway. Remember me telling you, well, remember me telling you about the kind of money we have, that funny money we got in our pocket it's made of paper? Remember me telling you about the Federal Reserve and they're really the ones in control of the company because the, the uh, borrower is servant to the lender. Do you see who Trump's fighting with right now? Do you know what they could do? They could turn your life upside down in a week. When you owe $20 trillion, $21 trillion, soon to be $22, I'm sure, when you owe that kind of money, Could that happen? Yeah, it could happen. 
sure would put a dent in your plans, wouldn't it? Put a dent in everybody's plans. Just be aware, there are so many things that could go wrong, so many things that could happen. I just want you to be prepared for them. I don't want you to stand there with this amazement on your face and this, these, you know, these saucer eyes looking at me like, what happened? What happened? We've just been attacked. It's time to fight back. Let's all stand.